Hi again, Year 9. This is Mrs Maloney and we're about to do Lesson 9 of your studies of Romeo and Juliet. So we're going to start off by casting our minds back to a lesson we've had earlier uh, this half term. And we read an essay by the Shakespeare scholar A.C. Bradley and it talked about the features of a tragic hero. So your do now task for today is to make a list or a mind map or note down somehow the main features of a tragic hero. With the extension task, has Juliet shown herself to be a typical tragic hero? Pause the recording now and make a note of your ideas. Hopefully you'll have jotted down some of the bullet points that we have on the slide in front of us, which relate to a tragic hero or heroine. The characters are high status. They are important people. The tragic hero acts, they try to do things. They don't just let things happen to them. Whatever they try to do, it always puts them in a worse situation. The tragic hero's actions lead to their deaths. They're exceptional, there's something that makes them special more than just being high status. And they have, and this is really important, a tragic flaw. What makes them so special also brings about their tragedy. These things describe then what a tragic hero is, like in a Shakespearean tragedy. Today we're going to read another essay by A.C. Bradley, but in this essay he's going to explain the plot of a Shakespearean tragedy. So hopefully you managed to record all of the things on those bullet points, but if you didn't, add them to your notes and pause the recording now to do so. In the past, We've explored how stories usually have a beginning, a middle and an end. However, we can now begin to talk about a story structure in a more sophisticated way. The essay we'll read today will help us to talk about structure in a more sophisticated manner. This is a phrase that you will need to know. It's really useful. And this is the status quo. Some of you may have heard that phrase before. The status quo is the situation that exists now without any changes. In most stories that we read, characters try to change the status quo, the situation. In Jane Eyre, for example, John Reed and Mrs. Reed's superiority was the status quo at Gateshead Hall. Jane challenged this when she fought back against John Reed. So she challenged the situation. She wanted to change it. The animals overcame the status quo when they chased Farmer Jones away from Manor Farm. So we can see in both of those um, scenarios, in those situations, um, the status quo was challenged. Someone was trying to change the current situation. Take a minute and read through the four scenarios which we have on this slide. Which of these situations describes a status quo? One, the country is run by politicians working in Westminster who are elected every five years. Two, the UK voted to leave the EU after being a member for over 40 years. Three, in 2016, Leicester City won the Premiership. For the previous 20 years, only five of the richest football clubs had won the Premiership. Four, a head teacher runs a school well and they receive good GCSE and A-level results each year. Pause the recording now and write down the statements which you think best describes the status quo. The two statements which best fit these are the country is run by politicians working in Westminster who are elected every five years. And number four, a head teacher runs a school well and they receive good GCSE results and A-level results each year. OK, um, so these are correct because they are the current situation and it's continuing and it's not challenged. And that's just how things are. The others are incorrect because they are unusual occurrences. OK, so the status quo is how things are at the moment. All right. So hopefully you managed to get those correct.
Today we're going to explore the plot of a Shakespearean tragedy. This will help us to understand the structure of Romeo and Juliet. Now to do this we're going to read an essay by a Shakespeare scholar called A.C. Bradley um, and you can see his dates there. His essays, lectures and books on Shakespeare have influenced the way people read Shakespeare. That means that he's had an effect um, on the way that people understand Shakespeare's plays. Many students will read his essays when they're studying Shakespeare at university and we can see we've got a picture of A.C. Bradley there. And for any of you that are interested in your English studies and thinking it's something you'd like to take further, if you do go on to do it at university, Shakespeare is almost certainly um, uh, something that you're going to look at in lots more detail. You've got this resource in your booklet, so can you please make sure that you found this? OK, um, and um, we'll read through it all together. So the resource that you need is on page eight of your booklet. So make sure that you have that now. If you haven't, quickly pause the recording and find it. We're going to read his essay. And as we read, it'd be really useful for you to have a pen or a highlighter again so that you can highlight or underline information about the three different parts of the plot of tragedies. All right. Um, so I'm going to read this to you because it's quite lengthy. And again, it might help for you to be able to go back and listen to it, um, pause it and just kind of go back through it as you wish. All right. So this is Bradley, A.C. Bradley, construction in Shakespeare's tragedies. In Shakespearean tragedy, lectures on Hamlet, Othello, King Lear and Macbeth. And it was written in 1905. So all of those plays that we just saw there, uh, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear and Macbeth, they are all tragedies. OK, Shakespeare, if you recall, wrote three different kind of categories of play. He wrote uh, tragedies, comedies and history plays. And we know that Romeo and Juliet fits the profile of a tragedy, which is why we're reading this now. OK, I'm going to read the top bit in the black box. All right. So this is an academic essay. The writer A.C. Bradley was and remains one of the world's most influential Shakespeare scholars. Today, students at universities will read Bradley's essays when they are studying Shakespeare. This essay explains what makes a Shakespearean tragedy and what kind of characters are the heroes in Shakespeare's tragedies. Now, this is important to note. The majority of tragic heroes are men, which is why Bradley refers to he and him. However, for us, Julia is also a tragic hero. So the pronouns can refer to men or women. OK, so it's important that we take that into account. So I want to just draw your attention before we start to the fact that on your sheet um, on one side, you've got a column and that's got some keywords which are picked out in bold. OK, and the reason that they are there is because they are part of a glossary, words that we perhaps might not know very well, we don't encounter very often. And they're there to help you to understand um, some of the things that this writer is trying to say about Shakespearean tragedy. OK, um, so we've got form, which means links to structure. We've got terminates, which means ends. We've got exposition, which means an introduction. We have bulk which means majority. We've got comprising or compromising, making up, sorry, compromising there, making up. We have catastrophe, which is an awful disaster. Arbitrary, which is random. The status quo, we've already encountered that, the existing state of things. Um, and turning over the page, we have opposing, which means warring. And then finally, we have inevitable, which means unavoidable. So those are the key words that as we read through, um, are referred to, but they're just giving you a little bit of a definition there. OK, I'm going to read through this with you so you can stop and pause at any time. Don't forget that you might want to underline or highlight information about the three different parts of the plot or tragedies. OK, here we go. Having discussed the substance of a Shakespearean tragedy, we should naturally go on to examine the form. I intend to speak of the construction 
of his plots. So construction, we link that to building, don't we? And when we're thinking about a story, it's no different. It's literally how a story is built, how it's put together, so it takes the form that it does. As a Shakespearean tragedy represents a conflict which terminates in a catastrophe, any such tragedy may roughly be divided into three parts. Number one, the first of these sets forth the situation out of which the conflict arises. It may therefore be called the exposition. So the first part of the story tells us what's happening. It introduces us to the setting, to the characters, um, perhaps to the issue which is going to form the core of the tragedy. Number two, the second deals with the definite beginning, the growth of the various conflicts. It forms the bulk of the play comprising the second, third and fourth acts and usually a part of the first and a part of the fifth. This middle section we may call rising tension. The final section of the tragedy shows the issue of the conflict in a catastrophe. So those are our three parts of a tragedy. OK, we have an exposition, we have rising tension, we have a catastrophe. The application of this scheme of division is naturally more or less arbitrary. The first part glides into the second and the second into the third, and there may often be difficulty in drawing the lines between them. So what he's saying there is that even though we've got these three parts, it can sometimes be difficult to pinpoint where one ends and another one begins. And we shouldn't worry too much about that at the moment. OK, moving on. So we're at the part where we've got the subheading exposition, which, as we've been told, is an introduction. The main business of the exposition is to introduce us into a little world of persons, to show us their positions in life, their circumstances, their relations to one another and perhaps something of their characters and to leave us keenly interested in the question, what will come out of this condition of things? In sort, Shakespeare establishes the status quo of the world of the play. So he establishes the existing condition. And if we think about that and link it to Romeo and Juliet, we know that the status quo at the beginning of the play is that there is masses of fighting on the streets of Verona because of this feud between the Montagues and the Capulets. And that is the existing state of things. It's how things are and it's how they've been for years. Um, OK, we are left expectant because their situation in regard to one to one another points to difficulties in the future. This situation is not one of conflict, but it threatens conflict. For example, we first see the hatred of the Montagues and Capulets, and then we see Romeo ready to fall violently in love. And then we hear talk of a marriage between Juliet and Paris. But the exposition is not complete and the conflict has not definitely begun to arise till in the last scene of the first act, Romeo the Montague sees Juliet the Capulet and becomes her slave. The end of the exposition is generally marked in the mind of the reader by a feeling that the action it contains is for the moment complete, but has left a problem. For example, in Romeo and Juliet, the lovers have met but their families are embroiled in a deadly feud. And so we ask, what will come of this? So it leaves us with a question. We, as the audience of Romeo and Juliet, know that Romeo and Juliet have fallen deeply in love and swiftly in love. We also know their families are at war. So it does make us wonder what on earth is going to happen here. And that leads us on to the, sec the next part, which is rising tension. We've got that subheading here. So we have obstacles. We now come to rising tension, which, const which constitutes the bulk of the play. In some tragedies, the tension can be identified with opposing persons or groups. So it is in Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth. But it's not always so. Indeed, the battle between the two families is not the only obstacle the heroes must overcome in Romeo and Juliet. Juliet must also act in defiance of her father's promise of marriage to his friend Paris. During the rising tension, the hero must overcome, must overcome the obstacles that lay in his way. 
these obstacles have been established in the exposition. So the obstacles are different things that are going to get in the way, aren't they, of our heroes. And we've just seen there in Romeo and Juliet, um, it's not only the fact that their families are, are at war, but Juliet's already been promised to be married to Paris. She doesn't know this. Romeo doesn't know this. But that's a problem. OK. Then we have a crisis. In all the tragedies, there's a critical point in the action, which proves also to be a turning point, which we may call the crisis. This crisis, as a rule, comes somewhere near the middle of the play. In the tragic plays, the crisis tends to be the point at which the hero obtains exactly what he has been striving towards. In Macbeth, this may be the successful assassination of Duncan and Macbeth's ascension to the throne. The fortunes of Romeo and Juliet rise and culminate in their marriage. That means that the crisis point there is their marriage. That's a sort of high point. But after this moment, their fortunes begin to decline, which ultimately concludes in a catastrophe. And we can see that with Romeo and Juliet. They desperately want to be together. And so they get married. And at that point, there's no turning back. The action can only go in one direction. And then finally, we have this idea of a catastrophe. We've already touched on the nature of the catastrophe, the final part of a Shakespearean tragedy. It is worth mentioning, however, that Shakespeare very re rarely makes the least attempt to surprise by his catastrophes. They are felt to be inevitable, though the precise way in which they will be brought about is not, of course, foreseen. Occasionally, where we dread the catastrophe because we love the hero, a moment occurs just before it in which a gleam of false hope lights up the darkening scene, and though we know it is false, it affects us. But no play at the end of which the hero remains alive is a tragedy. The story depicts the troubled part of the hero's life which precedes and leads up to his death. It is, in fact, essentially a tale of suffering and calamity concluding in death. So in a tragedy, it always ends in catastrophe and it always ends with the death of the hero. OK, so. Make sure that you go back and you listen to that and you reread it if you need to. You've got plenty of time to do that. It's here on the recording to help you. OK, so let's check your understanding of what we've just read. OK, you can mind map the answers to these questions or you can write them down in a, in a response, a sentence response. It's entirely up to you. What you can see here is we've got six questions and we've got the line numbers in brackets to help identify where you need to look. You've also got the line numbers down the side. So hopefully it should be easier for you to find the answers that you need. So here are the questions. Number one. Which part of a tragic plot could be described as the beginning, the exposition, rising tension or a catastrophe? You need to look at lines 1 to 16 to find the answer to that question. Number two, what three things make up the exposition in Romeo and Juliet? You need to look at lines number 27 to 38 for that. Number three, what is an obstacle? For that, we need to look at lines number 45 to 56. And then number four, what are two obstacles in Romeo and Juliet? And again, lines number 45 and 56. Number five, in the tragic plays, the hero obtains exactly what he's been striving towards. What is this moment called? And we're looking at lines 57 to 68 here. And then finally, number six, does the catastrophe come as a shock to the audience in a Shakespearean tragedy? And for the answer to that, you want to look at lines 69 to 84. So you pause the recording at this point, go back through the um, essay that we've just read and see if you can find the answers and pop them down, write them down, do a mind map. It's entirely up to you on your piece of paper. Here are the answers to the questions we had on the previous slide. So this is an opportunity for you to write down any that you didn't get, to correct any that you got wrong 
or to just check your answers and that you've got them all right, which is hopefully uh, the outcome that we've got here. So number one, the exposition is the beginning of the story. This is where the situation or status quo of the story is established. Number two, in Romeo and Juliet, the exposition shows the audience that, number one, uh, the Montagues and Capulets are in a deadly feud. Number two, Lord Capulet has told Paris that he may marry Juliet. And number three, Romeo and Juliet fall deeply in love with one another. Number three, an obstacle is a problem that the heroes must try to overcome. Number four, Romeo and Juliet need to overcome two obstacles, the bitter feud between their families and the fact that Juliet is meant to marry Paris. Number five, the moment the hero obtains what he's been striving towards is known as the crisis. And finally, number six, in a Shakespearean tragedy, the catastrophe does not come as a shock to the audience. It is inevitable. So check your answers against these. Add any information you've missed. And make sure that you have those things uh, recorded accurately for your notes. So we found out a lot about the conventions of a Shakespearean tragedy. Remembering these conventions or rules is another way of thinking about conventions will continue to be important as we read through the play Romeo and Juliet. However, before we read any more, we're going to look at where we've encountered these conventions or rules already in the play. You have this resource in your booklet that you've been sent from us. Um, and this resource is going to summarise for us what makes a tragic hero and what makes a tragic plot. And it's all going to be kept in one place. We're going to return to this document throughout the unit. So it's really important that you record your ideas clearly and accurately, but also that you keep it safe and bring it back to school when we eventually get there. So what you can see is that we've got some of the... Um, features of a tragic hero at the top half and then we've got some of the features of the tragic plot towards the bottom so make sure you have this resource and a pen ready please today you're going to complete some parts of this resource you're going to provide a quotation that shows this part of the play we're going to do one all together you need to find the prologue in your pack uh, and you need to find line one. So can you do that now? Pause the recording if you need to in order to find it. So the prologue in the first line describes the families as two households, both alike in dignity. OK, the top two boxes tell us that the tragic characters are of high status. So you need to write this quotation and you can see on the slide in the top box, we've picked it out in red so you can see exactly where you need to write it. And you need to write this quotation across those two boxes and you're going to show and explain how you know that Romeo and Juliet are high status characters. So pause the recording for a moment to write the quote in that top box to do with the tragic hero about the characters being high status and then explain how you know Romeo is high status and how you know Juliet is high status. I'm hoping that your box looks a little bit like this. Um, and what we can see then in our resource is that we've got the characters of high status, they're important people. We've got this quotation, two households both alike in dignity. And this um, word dignity is really important because that shows that they are equally alike in terms of their importance and what we can see here is that we have Romeo is the son of Lord Montague a powerful family in Verona Juliet is the daughter of Lord Capula a wealthy and powerful family in Verona your um, resource should look a little bit like that with ideas like that written down if you haven't managed to write anything take your time now pause the recording and get that jotted down Your turn now. So using the prologue again, okay, um, 
you are going to, and you might need to go back and look at another um, lesson actually, but you are going to try and complete the boxes marked below. Use the line references to help you find a brief quotation. But this is to do with the tragic plot. So if you can, find a quotation and explain how you know that the Capulets are at war. Okay, Lord Capula has promised his daughter to Paris. If you can find a quotation and explain why this is important or what aspect of a tragic plot this is, um, that would be, that's what you need to put in there. So you might need to look back at the essay as well. So pause the recording now and see what you can fill in in those red boxes there, which you can see have got the arrows drawn to them. So far, we've almost read the exposition of Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare is still establishing the status quo. At the moment, we're still finding out about the world of the play and its characters. And as we discover more, we'll return to this resource to document how Romeo and Juliet is a Shakespearean tragedy. So this resource is really important um, and you need to keep it somewhere safe. As always, we're going to finish with a kind of knowledge roundup and just check what we know. So which of these statements describes the status quo in Romeo and Juliet? Is it A, the deadly feud between the families has been going on for many, many years? Is it B, Romeo and Juliet has a tragic plot? Is it C, Lord Capulet has given Paris permission to marry his daughter? Is it D, Romeo and his friends use masks to disguise themselves at Capulet's masked ball? Or is it E, Romeo uses religious imagery to invite Juliet to kiss him at the Capulet ball? Pause the recording now and write down the statement that you feel best describes the status quo in Romeo and Juliet. And the answers are, of course, A, the deadly feud between the families has been going on for many, many years. And Lord Capulet has given Paris permission to marry his daughter. It would have been common in those times for a father to do that. In fact, it would have been expected, which is what makes it the status quo. OK, year nine. So that's it from me this week. Um, thank you so much for your attention and for the hard work that you are putting into your studies. Um, as before, if you have any problems at all, just email and let, let us know and we'll try and help you as best we can. But don't forget, these recordings are on Show My Homework. You can access them through the YouTube link as well. So make sure that you go back and take your time um, to really understand what's happening. All right. Take care. Year nine. Have a lovely weekend and I'm sure that we'll speak soon.